Susan. So di pa ka tukol na pa. Wala nang mas pagkakaroon. Happy Sabbath everyone. We would like to invite those who are in the, mother, uh, the, mother, uh, in the mother's room to please come inside in the sanctuary. Why don't we just occupy here? We're only just few. So we would, uh, we would like to welcome everyone for our inspiration, uh, including those who are watching us on uh, online. So uh, despite all the news, bad news that we heard or the bad things that are happening around us, we can still uh, uh, be safe in Jesus because Jesus is his, our rock, he's our refuge, and he's our salvation. So any who are with Jesus, um, Jesus, I can safely go. It's hymn number 508, any who are with Jesus. Just when I need him most. Just when I need him most. Or we just go to. Jesus is here to comfort and cheer, just when I need him. 
are old uh, rise and we will sing hymn number 50 five zero abide with me Gracious, loving Heavenly Father, thank you for this uh, wonderful day. Thank you that it is Sabbath again, and we want to praise you, Lord, for all the blessings that you bestowed upon us throughout the week, and also for the care that you have uh, shown to us. We, some of us might have some rough days this week, Lord, but it's comforting to know that you are always uh, taking care of us, and you are helping us in um, some other ways that sometimes we don't even know. As we continue our uh, program tonight, Lord, we uh, want to ask the guidance of the Holy Spirit, especially for our speaker tonight, and may, may you use him, may you anoint his lips so that uh, he can bring your message that you want us to hear. And we want to pray also for those who are uh, watching online or to our brethren who are still on their way or for those who was not able to come for different reasons, Lord, may you be with them, may you bless them, and uh, may, the, um, may each and every one of us feel the guidance of the Holy Spirit. Thank you, Lord, and forgive us from all our sins. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Good evening, everyone, and happy Vespers. Happy Sabbath. So, um, tonight we're happy to be here. We're happy to uh, praise God and thank God uh, all together for all the blessings and all the care that we received throughout the week. And we would like also to greet our online viewers who are watching through uh, Facebook Live. And tonight, 
our uh, uh, actually I can remove my mask now we heard that it's okay to remove our mask <laughs> and yeah uh, we're happy to hear that and at the same time we're a, li a little bit worried because we don't know who are the people around us so uh, probably we have to put some yeah be careful have some caution yeah so tonight our um, program is sponsored by the Deaconess Department and uh, we would like to thank our uh, uh, sister um, Modesta, Sister Netnet, and Sister Lani in uh, helping us in our uh, song service and Rance in the, as our pianist. So, um, have you noticed we are almost at the middle of March? The, uh, the days are flying so fast. And it's a good news for our uh, students, uh, the elementary and high school students, because uh, starting tonight, uh, they have their spring break for two weeks. So two weeks to rest. And also, uh, it, we maybe use that two weeks to recuperate the time that we lost communing with God because we are... Uh, too busy with our uh, school work. So tonight, because our um, deaconesses are leading, uh, deaconesses department is leading our program, we will hear a special number from Sister Gemma Bakabak, uh, supported by Brother Levi. And because uh, our spouses are supportive of our deaconesses. Our message will be uh, will bring to us by Brother Dan Tingson. And after his message, uh, we planned before um, who will be our speaker, but then uh, we have to do some changes. And uh, we're so glad that the spouses are very supportive. So they accepted the, uh, to, uh, the part. And for our closing song, we ask Nane Sally to render us our, uh, a special number. And our closing prayer will be uh, our speaker. So our program will, uh, will be as follows. So let's give the time to Sister Gemma. And I think uh, we want to thank her for accepting the the part, the special number. Thank you.
Good evening, everyone. To all our online viewers this evening on Facebook Live, and also for those present here tonight, I would like to welcome you. Happy Vesper, and happy Sabbath to everyone. Would like our welcome our guests, Claudine from Suri. You're welcome. Thank you for joining us this evening. Any more visitor tonight? None. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Sister Gemma and Brother Levi for that wonderful song. The title is, what is the title, Jesus? It's the sweetest name of all. There's no other sweetest name in this world but the name of Jesus. Thank you again. Before we proceed on our study this evening, I want to request you to bow down our heads for a short prayer. Heavenly Father, this evening we would like to invite your holy presence as we worship you in spirit and in truth. Please cleanse us from any unrighteousness and make us worthy to receive your blessing tonight. Fill us with the Holy Spirit as we study your word this evening. Use me and speak your words through me. In the loving name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. So how, how is your week to, so far? Busy, tired? We are fortunate we have a, a rest day. Actually two days, Saturday, Sunday. <laughs> but we opted to worship the Lord on Saturday as written in the Bible. I will consider it a privilege to stand before you uh, to share the word of God. I believe that everyone is given a talent or talents. And unfortunately, in my case, preaching is not one of them. Instead, I prefer to sit down and listen to Elder Ed Flores or Elder Joey's preaching. But today is an exception. As part of our church leadership, it is also my sacred duty to share the word of the Lord to our members as needed. Tonight we will deal with one of the most difficult question or topic in human life. The experience of pain and suffering. That's the title of my message this evening. Why God allow pain and suffering. And our verse in the Bible can be found in Romans 8.28. If you have your Bible with you, I will be reading on New King James Version, that's my version of my Bible I have. It says here, verse 28, and we know, let's look if it is there, that working, I'm gonna turn it on. Okay, there you go, I'm gonna read it on my Bible. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God and to those who are called according to his purpose. If you go back to this text, it says all things work together. When you say the word all things, that includes good things? Does it include bad things? <laughs> Suffering and pain as well? So these things Work together for, for our good to those who love. Do you love our Lord? Oh, yeah. So it is part of our Christian living. These things that mentioned here, which is includes pain and suffering. And those who are called according to his purpose. The, his purpose is capital. What is the eternal purpose of God? The eternal purpose of God is to save sinners by grace. That is in Ephesians 3.11, 2 Timothy 1.9. To start with, I would like <clears throat> to ask you a personal question, if you may. And this is my question for you tonight. What is the most painful experience you had in your life? Either it is physical or it is emotional. I'll start with myself. Last year, month of April, I lost my mom. She died. 
And after nine months, my dad passed away too. So it is a painful experience for the loss of my loved one. So right now, I am an orphan. I don't have mom, and I don't have dad. But I'm happy I have my family, my church family, that adopts me. Okay, who wants? Brother Rudel. Just one word. Okay, pass. <laughs> Sister Modesta. Okay. Uh -huh. So what did he do that? He, he ran away many years and he went away from the dormitory that you know, the dormitory. So it's killing time with the court, most of the time they look for us in the jail because we try to go home and we cannot cross the river and uh, so we see that it's just um, the big long and the small one in between the past the small okay. uh, Overflow or heat, yeah. yeah. The whole community in the school, uh, he by a uh, Oh, you are lost. <laughs> Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Any other? Anyone? Father Levi? Painful experience in life? Oh, lost of, yeah, loss of loved one. Yeah, that one. Mm. So maybe loss of a job, broken family, betrayal that we consider painful also. Physically, childbirth, all mothers have experienced uh, painful experience like uh, childbirth, isn't it? Childbirth, other died because of childbirth. So basically, it is a painful experience physically. But there are also experience um, that is emotionally uh, painful. Okay. As we proceed in our <clears throat> study of the word, I would like to find out how well, you know your Bible. I'm going to tell you the story, and please listen carefully. Sam is a seminary freshman student. One of his professors asked, Sam, can you tell me the parable of the Good Samaritan for your exam? Yes, sir, I will. I will, sir, Sam replied. Then Sam began. When there was this man traveling from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among the throne. So he is the, the, the parable of the Samaritan. Let's continue. The Thor sprang up and choked him as he went on. He didn't have money. Then he met the queen, the queen of Sheba. And she gave him a thousand talents of gold and a thousand chains of raiments. Then he got into a chariot and dro drove furiously. And he was driving while he was driving under the big juniper tree, his head caught up on the limb of the tree. He hung there many days, and the ravens brought him food to eat and water to drink. And he ate 5,000 loaves of bread and two fishes. One night while he was hanging there asleep, his wife Delilah came along and cut off his hair. And he dropped and fell on the stony ground. And as he got up and went on, it began to rain, and it rained 40 days and 40 nights. He hid himself in the cave, and he lived on locusts 
and wild honey. Then he went on and come down to Jericho. And when he got there, he looked up and he saw the old queen Jezebel. He is sitting, do <coughs> sitting down up high in a window. She laughed at him and he said, throw her down. And they threw her down. And he said, throw her down again. And they threw her down again 70 times 7. And out of the fragments, they pick up 12 baskets full beside women and children. And they said, blessed are the peacemaker, P-I-E-C-E. -E. <laughs> the professor was impressed with the breadth of his knowledge of the biblical parables, but he had to fail him because he mixed up the content of the stories. It was a great made-up story, brilliantly done, but wrong context. So the lesson for us today is, let not, let's not only learn the scripture by text, but learn the whole context in order for us not to be misled by anyone. So let's move on to our topic. We know that pain is a deep-seated reality. It's not just in the term, in a physical term, but also emotional and spiritual terms. Sometimes pain itself has nothing to do with us other than the fact that you are witnessing it. Maybe a family member or someone close to us, and we want to find out the answer why someone has to go through this suffering. I would like to bring you to one of the oldest book in the Bible and let's see how he processes it. We know the basic drama of Job, isn't it? We know that he lost all his possession, he lost his family, and finally he lost his physical well-being. He's covered from head to toe with source. He is about to talk to God when his wife came and gave him some advice. So in Job 2, 9, verse 9 and 10, in New King James Version, it says, Then his wife said to him, Do you still hold fast to your integrity? Curse God and die. But he said to her, You speak as one of the foolish women. Woman speaks. Shall we indeed accept good from God and shall not accept adversity? In all this, Job did not sin with his lips. But at this point, Job was holding on that slender thread on the sovereign God. He was agonizing with his theological belief and assumption. What is uh, belief and assumption? It says, be good and be blessed. Be bad and be cursed. Be good and be blessed and be bad and be cursed. That is his assumption. That means obey God, you will be blessed. Disobey God and you will be cursed. Job, uh, Job is faithful and believe on a sovereign God. He is asking why he received all of this. He wanted to know why he's suffering and if he had done something wrong, he wants an explanation. And he was trying to make a sense out of it all. So Job began to complain. The biggest uh, problem right in the beginning was his friends. But you remember the name of the friends? <laughs> okay, very good. <laughs> I don't know if you ever thought of giving your son this name, <laughs> Elephas, Bildad, or so far. Myself, I never dream about giving it this name. But the best thing they done, they did, was they when they sat down, silent for a few days, sitting only by the job job side, and the problem began when they start to open their mouths or their lips. But Job asked them, what kind of miserable comforters are you? 
you're supposed to be my friends. Friends at least try to comfort. Try to comfort you from pain. Instead of showing compassion, they become judgmental. And their advice made more harm than good. They forgot that the God of justice is the same as the most compassionate being in the universe. Suffering does not always come as a result of sin committed by the suffering person. Job suffered as the result of evils brought into his life by Satan. God allowed Satan to cause pain and suffering without letting Job know about it. Finally, Job comes directly to God. And out of the silence, he answered him. And God asked him, do you know how many questions? God asked him 64 questions back to back. Which was the last thing that Job wanted. He wanted answers, but God gave him questions. God said, all right, I will talk to you like a man. When, where were you? When the foundation of the world was laid, were you there when the boundaries are set? And then on and on and on. These are all the questions, a series of questions that God asked uh, Job, which question deals with the intricacies and the majesty of his creation. And God continued, tell me now, do you comprehend the world around you? Do you understand all of this? Actually, God is opening up with Job's assumption. When you question the questionnaire, you determine the entry point of the discussion. That's what exactly God is doing with Job. God wants Job, or God wants to reveal to Job that he is the creator at the same time he is the designer of this world. By the way, we know the end of the story, isn't it? It's a happy ending. Job uh, restored his health. His properties, or his uh, belongings has been returned back twofold, twice, meaning he's richer more than before. He got children. And we, leave, we believe that this God who gave who healed Job is a healer and he is the restorer. But in this world, there are two kinds of people. Or two kinds of evil, I mean, in this world. Number one is the natural evil. This is refers to the natural disaster like earthquake, famine, storm, tornado, even cancer. Birth defects, they are considered a natural evil. Number two, or the second one is the moral evil. This is the willful acts of a human being against his fellow humans, like murder and rape. In the case of Job, what are the nat natural uh, evil? In verse 16 of the chapter 1, it says, The fire from heaven fell down and burned up the sheep and the servants. In verse 19, it says, Suddenly a great wind came from the wilderness and struck the house, and all his sons and daughters were killed. In chapter 2, verse 67, Job was struck with painful boils from the sole of his foot to the crown of his head. How about moral evil? In case of Job, in verse 14, it says, The Sabaeans, these are the people from other place, raided them and took the oxen and donkeys and killed the servants. In verse 17, it says, The Chaldeans raided them and took the camels and killed the servants. So in relation to this case, many people, especially the atheists, the agnostic, the skeptic, raise up a challenging question to us Christians. They place this question into a trilemma, not dilemma. It's called trilemma. Let's see what it is. Okay, there you go. This is the trilemma. Christian says that God is all-powerful. We believe that, isn't it? Christian says that God is all-loving, and yet sin and evil exist. 
In this world, there are two kinds of human beings right from the beginning of time until our present. These are the obedient people. These are the ones who bow their heads, bend their knees, and pray to God and says, may your will be done. And these other ones are the disobedient, those who are rebellious to God, those who raise their fists against God, and God will say to them, okay, may your will be done for now. The origin of the earliest question, it began not after Christ, but it is before Christ. It is the earliest question of trilemma. It is in 340 BC, three centuries and a half before the birth of Jesus Christ. There was an ancient Greek philosopher. His name is Epicurus. I don't know the last name. He stated, is God willing to prevent evil, but not able? Then he is impotent. Is God able but not willing to prevent evil? Then he is a malevolent. Is he both able and willing? Then from whence comes evil? If you translate that into modern language or translation, it means this. If God is unable to prevent evil, then he is not all powerful. If God is not willing to prevent evil, uh, evil, he is not all good and loving. If God is both willing and able to prevent evil, then why does evil exist? So this is the trilemma. So atheists, those don't believe in God, try to disprove the existence of God. They said that there is no God. Because if there is an all-powerful, all-loving God and has the sovereign power to stop or eliminate all pain and suffering of humanity, this is the most challenging and the thorniest question by an atheist to a theist or to a Christian. If there is a God, why does evil and suffering exist? How can you answer this Thorniest question without using the Bible because skeptics themselves don't believe in the Bible. There's a man, he said, C.S. Lewis, he said, it is critically important to examine the assumption within a question. There was a suggestion how to deal with this question. First, answer the question with a question, like, why you are asking this question and what are your assumptions? Then you proceed by asking a critical question like, like this example. When you say there is an evil, aren't you assuming that there's such a thing as good? What's your answer for that? Of course, yes. When you say that there's such a thing as good, aren't you assuming that there's such a thing as a moral law? or a moral standard in which to base, to differentiate between good and evil? Yeah, of course. When you say that as a moral law, you must pose it to a moral lawgiver, which is God, but that's whom they try to disprove. Then you can explain further. If there's no moral law giver, which is God, there's no moral law. If there's no moral law, there is no good. And if there's no good, there's no evil. Their question, of course, will subdistract due to the lack of coherence. To understand it further, let's go to the origin of sin and evil. And I would like to begin with a question. So I will make it like a question and an answer so we can look uh, it better. So, number one question is, how is it possible for sin to enter and exist in a perfect and a holy environment in heaven in the presence of a holy God? I'll repeat the question. How is it possible for sin to enter and exist in a perfect and a holy environment in heaven in the presence of a holy God? How could we answer that question? There is a reference in 
uh, inspired writings, it is in Great Controversy, page 419, and it says, Sin is an intruder for whose presence no reason can be given. It is mysterious, unaccountable. To excuse it is to defend it. Could a reason be found or cause to be shown for its existence, it would cease to be a sin. The Bible denies the eternal nature of sin and evil by affirming that such phenomenon had the beginning and will also have an end. Since God is eternal and sin and evil is, are not, we can conclude that they do not belong to the divine essence. So that's clear. Next question. Why did God permit or allow Lucifer to exist after wickedness found in him? Some theologians have established the, di the distinction between the nature of Lucifer and his will. His nature was, as a created by God, was good, but his will, his freedom to choose, as used by him, led him to sin. God is responsible for the first, but not responsible for the second. The misuse of the will is based on, but not determined by, the freedom which, which God invested to his intelligent creatures. I have a verse here. It's in Isaiah 55, 9 says, As the heavens are higher than the earth, so my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts higher or than your thoughts. It means God is infinite. We are finite. How can you mend that gap of understanding? God's thoughts are far from us, meaning we cannot comprehend God, not because God does not want to be comprehended, but it is our limited understanding that uh, blocks our understanding of God. Once he decided to create, no real or potential force would force him to alter his plan. Otherwise, the fear of sin would have defeated him before he created anything. God is the fearless one who, without changing his plan, decided to confront the problem of sin and evil and to resolve it once and for all through his son. And he did it. It can be found in the story of redemption. The humiliation of God becoming a human to die for a simple race is eternally preserved to ensure that sin will never rise again. This is the incarnation as a part of Christ's sacrifice and suffering for us. In the heart of the gospel, there is the story of suffering. Let's go to the next question. Is it not better if God made us or created create us without a feeling of pain and suffering? Good question. Is it, is it not better? Sa Tagalog pa eh, di ba magaling na tayo mga manhid na lang? <laughs> we don't feel it? <laughs> I will uh, answer it by giving you a short uh, a story. Yeah, this one is a real story unlike the other one. And it is the story of Aslan Blocker. It's a young girl from uh, Georgia, USA. Aslan Blocker, he was, uh, she was featured in one of the national interview in America. Then the interviewer interviewed the mother. When the baby was born, the mother realized that something is wrong with the baby because it didn't cry. When the doctors diagnose her, nothing is wrong because everything looks fine. Till they found out later that she has a SIPA. SIPA is a congenital insensitivity to pain with anhydrosis. This is a rare genetic condition. She doesn't feel any pain, no pain whatsoever. She could step on a nail, puncture their skin, get infected without knowing it. Or he can put her hand 
on the burner without feeling her hands being burned. The mother ended the interview crying. The mother said, every night when I go to bed, I pray to God. And I say, God, please give my daughter the ability to feel the pain. I repeat, every night before he go to bed, he pray to, the, to, Lord, to God and he say, God, please give my daughter the ability to feel the pain. In this sinful world, pain and suffering are the indicator to us that there is something wrong and it get us to seek God's help. Pain is necessary in life and can be a blessing as well. God he is able to sustain us both in physical and emotional struggle as also in the deepest pain that all that is the spiritual alienation. God already dealt with this problem by sending his only son, Jesus Christ, in this sinful world. God became a human in order to save us. This evening, I don't know <clears throat> what are you going through in your life. But I would like to propose to you some of the reasons I found why God allow pain and suffering. But because of our limited perspective, we understand neither God nor suffering completely. These are my proposition to you this evening in pain and suffering and why God allowed it. Number one, God, uh, nothing can touch the Christians except by our Lord's permission as in the case of Job. Whatever happened to you, God permitted it. Job 1, 12, 2 and 6. Number two, God allowed pain and suffering not to destroy us, but to refine and sanctify us. Romans 8, 17. It is for the development of our Christian character. Last, pain and suffering teach us the truth about our frail and dying condition and cause us to rely for God for support and salvation. And finally, at the end of our life, one of these three things happen to our heart. You may end up either with a hard heart, with a tender heart, or a broken heart. My appeal to you this evening is to keep that tender heart. Remember that in our pain and suffering, God is our comforter, our healer, and our restorer. Let's hold on to God's promises. And I got three for you this evening. There are many promises, but I would like to give you three promises that God gave us. Number one is 2 Corinthians 12, 9 from NIB. It says, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is to make perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast of all more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. Eventually, in, this, in his perfect time, God will create a new heaven and a new earth and get rid of all the pain and suffering, sin, death, and give us an everlasting life. And this promise, number two, in Revelation 12, 1, to 4, 1 and 4 says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth has passed away, he will wipe every tears, tear from their eyes. There will be no more death, nor mourning, nor crying, or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. Number three promise that we could look upon to is in Isaiah 26, 3 and 4. You keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. Trust in the Lord forever. For the Lord God is an everlasting rock. 
Trusting in these trying times is an act of faith. Always remember that God does not leave us alone in times of our greatest trials. Right now, I know that each and every one of us are going through different type of suffering or pain. It might be a relational problem, a broken heart, you lose your job, financial difficulties, serious health problem. If you want to cast all your burdens and surrender your will to God, and if you want to renew your relationship with him, I'll invite you this evening to stand with me, and I will pray for you. What I know is the Lord of the universe in his sovereign grace, his hand is not short to help us. He is just a prayer away. Let's pray. Bow our heads, please. A loving Heavenly Father, we humbly come to your throne of grace. Lord, I uplift to you today our brothers and sisters, those who have health issues, those with broken hearts, and those with relational problems. Also, ex those experiencing loss of job, financial worries. You are <clears throat> the God who heals. Please mend their broken relationship. You are the God who works miracles. Please extend your healing touch to them. You are the God that provides material and spiritual blessings. As we face with uncertainty these days, Lord, we need you more than ever. And we would like to recommit our life to you today. Please come into our hearts and give us that peace that passes understanding and give us hope as we walk with you in faith every day. Help us to fully trust you, O Lord. Help us to value the importance of our health and also to count every blessings that we receive from you. Lord, please hear our prayer. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. We can hear a special uh, closing music from Nanay Sally. Me. 
Thank you very much, Nanay Sali, for that uh, song. Shall we all stand for a closing prayer? Let's pray. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So good night and happy Sabbath. See you tomorrow. It is the group number one will be uh, coming. Okay. Good night, everyone.